Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a good break, and I hope I won't stop your digesting pro process with my presentation. Um, so briefly, uh, I'm Luca Battistella. I'm from the European Commission Joint Research Center. We are based in uh, Ispra, uh, Lake Maggiore, north of Italy. Um, I work as a geospatial developer uh, within a project called BioPama. BioPama stands for Biodiversity and Protected Areas Management. Um, in this context, um, I have developed a tool for addressing biodiversity and ecosystem services hotspots globally uh, using uh, different products and combining them into a multi-criteria weighted um, analysis um, toolkit. So um, we normally address protected areas um, issues, so protected areas pressures, uh, anthropogenic pressures, or uh, decrease or increase of water availability, both uh, seasonal and permanent water or uh, forest loss gain, and so on and so forth. Uh, with this tool, we are going to address um, issues that are outside protected areas and to actually find hotspots in terms of biodiversity and ecosystem services. Um, so actually, many studies uh, now are highlighting the need to increase uh, protected area network. Uh, and uh, today, the main mechanism for uh, um, uh, conserve our land uh, is represented by uh, protected areas. Um, the global deal for nature uh, has set 30% of the global lands to be formally protected and an additional 20% to be set as climate stabilization areas, so the famous uh, 30 by 30 um, target. So today, um, just about 50% of the global land are actually formally protected. Um, and it was estimated that uh, half of the important sites in terms of biodiversity are actually protected. Therefore, we have another half that can be uh, protected. And how do we know where biodiversity, ecosystem services, natural areas, forests are uh, in, in the world? Uh, available for protection. That's why uh, uh, we will be talking about the conservation analysts today. So when we started developing this, um, uh, this product, this, uh, this application, uh, we had a look on the web and we noticed that um, there's, a, th there's plenty of tools addressing biodiversity uh, and ecosystem services, layers and information but most of them are there for visualization purposes and you cannot really interact with the information uh, you find. Uh, so we wanted to uh, give the possibility to use uh, a tool which relies on updated and reliable uh, information and, and data sets to provide decision makers with a, uh, means to identify easily uh, these sort of areas. So out there, there are also other tools uh, that deal with these sort of uh, topics, but they are normally uh, uh, specialized uh, con systematic conservation planning tools, and they are quite difficult, and the learning curve is quite steep. Uh, so we wanted to simplify some things but not lose uh, the information needed for addressing these sort of issues, at least in a preliminary scale when we start uh, the conservation planning process. Um, so the methodology uh, we adopted is uh, split into uh, three main stages. Uh, so there's a data collection and data preparation that we will go through in a minute. 
um, data um, dissemination, so uh, providing APIs and providing all the sort of services we need uh, to display information and interact with information on the web. Um, and then there's the front end part uh, in which uh, we have developed uh, this sort of application uh, that I'll show you uh, later. So the data set uh, included so far is what we consider a, pl a preliminary uh, list of data set that nothing here is uh, set on stone. Um, we can uh, increase uh, the number of uh, data sets uh, that we will call variables from now on uh, quite easily. For now we have 10 and we are addressing, as I say, the biodiversity component uh, through the amphibians, birds and mammals uh, presence, both uh, overall presence and uh, threatened endemic uh, species presence. Natural areas, intact forest, uh, permanent seasonal presence, water presence, and above and below uh, ground carbon. Um, so data preparation uh, is quite a long process that we try to uh, automatize uh, using uh, Python and, and QG, QGIS combined. Um, there's a first uh, phase of normalization of the information uh, we, of the variables that we uh, show in the platform, in the, in the application. So all the variables are normalized uh, zero to one in order to be able to uh, compare them and to uh, merge the information into one single indicator. So we took the raster, we, um, for each cell, we subtract the minimum value uh, and divide it by the maximum minus the minimum value for each pixel, so we get uh, a normalized uh, raster zero to one. Uh, we reproject uh, using, um, we actually project the information using uh, Web Mercator. Uh, because we are going to show it, the information and interact with that in, uh, in Mapbox here. Uh, we resample uh, the data sets at five kilometers um, globally, so five kilometers at the equator is not going to be equal area, fortunately. Um, and then we rescale uh, this, um, all, all the data sets. Um, uh, using a baseline layer that we created. Uh, and uh, there you have to use a, a resampling method when you go through this process and for continuous rasters, for instance, for above and below uh, ground carbon, we used uh, the average resampling method and for discrete rasters, such as water presence or uh, natural areas, we use the nearest uh, neighbor method. So then we, uh, uh, we converted the raster to, uh, to points. Uh, why? Because we want to, uh, to perform statistics uh, easily on the web. So with raster was a bit more complicated and uh, less fast, uh, at least with the technology uh, I'm used to work with. Um, and then we sample uh, all uh, the, uh, the points, the, the, the pixels behind the point grid we have created. And we store basically uh, this information on uh, a Postgres database. So we import uh, the shape file with containing the points um, at five kilometers uh, resolution or distance between the points. Uh, and, um, and we import in, in, in the Postgres database also uh, DCSV. We keep this information separate because we want to um, be able to add easily 
uh, information in the table uh, that is going to be joined then through uh, automatic functions with the, with the points. Um, so aside from this uh, function, which is easy to understand, so we basically join information and we grab the uh, country code uh, as well to be able to uh, compute country statistics uh, on the fly. Uh, we have also uh, set up um, some, some, some other functions that uh, create statistics within uh, protected areas in a country or uh, outside protected areas or the overall scores for, uh, for each variable. You will see it in the demo uh, after, uh, after some slides. Um, we, of course, create spatial indexes um, to make it faster. We actually store the information in materialized view, views uh, in, in Postgres. Uh, and we notice that there's a big difference combining it with GeoServer, and I'll come to that in a minute, uh, using materialized views. Uh, and then, as I said, we harvest information from the Postgres database into GeoServer, and we provide services um, through GeoWebCache as vector ties. Uh, we use vector ties because uh, we think it is the fastest way to interact with uh, spatial information and create spatial analysis uh, directly on the browser. Uh, at least we found is the fastest uh, solution uh, for us. So as you can see, uh, that one, in, the red one is the response of the vector ties and is about uh, 10 million uh, points that are loaded in once. Uh, for some countries, uh, the query is very fast. For some others, like Canada, Russia, and so on, the query can take up to five seconds, six seconds. So it's not ideal in the web nowadays. So the application development part, uh, I already say it won't be super exhaustive. Uh, it's, it's kind of a big... Um, a uh, bunch of um, uh, functions, but I'll go through uh, the, the, the four main components. Uh, one is uh, visualization purposes. Uh, one is for uh, um, weighting, you know, how the weightings uh, works in the, in the application. Uh, and the other one is related to country analysis and to user-based uh, analysis. So here you can see a, a sneak peek of uh, Madagascar. So in the first uh, image, uh, we consider natural state of lands, including natural areas from, from Copernicus land cover. So we uh, basically take areas that are not affected by uh, anthropogenic uh, interventions. So no cities, no agriculture, and so on and so forth. Uh, and intact forest from WWF. The second one is related to um, the carbon storage, both uh, below ground carbon and above ground carbon. And the third one is related to um, species presence. In this case, it's birds, amphibians, and mammals. So, okay, five minutes. I'll go fast. Uh, it's important that you see the demo, mainly. Um, so, this is for computing. Uh, the, uh, the gradient uh, that is applied to uh, the point features. We always need to compute the minimum, maximum, and mean values for all the points uh, that we query. Uh, this is the uh, UI where you can uh, actually turn on and off uh, or include or exclude variables, give way to each variables. So basically what in conservation planning we call conservation priorities and remove protected areas if you need. Uh, this is just what I said in a different uh, format. Uh, then, as I said, you can perform uh, spatial analysis, um, drawing 
polygons with infinite uh, arcs and nodes uh, or uh, simply a square if you need. Um, that's based on TARF, uh, so we use the stack is Postgres, GeoServer, Vector Tiles, Mapbox, GL, and TARF for conducting spatial um, um, analysis and statistics. Um, we use points within Polygon for extracting the information um, that, uh, that are below the, the, the Polygon that the user drops. Um, the information coming from that function will be feeding a uh, radar plot where you can actually compare what's going on in terms of biodiversity and ecosystem services values between protected areas in a country, in a country overall, and the area that actually you have uh, selected. Some caveats, uh, the tool, uh, as I say, is designed to, for decision makers at lo uh, high level, so uh, not for local authorities. Uh, this is for addressing um, areas, for understanding where areas deserve to be protected or not. Um, the current resolution can be further improved. Of course, we are talking about five meters of resolution. Uh, probably with uh, reducing the number of uh, services by providing one service for each country, we can go down to one kilometer easily or even 500 meters. Uh, next step, there are many here. I pointed only three. Uh, but let's have a look at the demo. Uh, so I actually proved that the tool exists. Um, so you, you click on a country, you get information about all the variables um, that I was talking about earlier, uh, and you get this information inside protected areas or within the country as a whole. Uh, you have also the index uh, related to biodiversity at country level or within uh, protected areas within that country. In this case, you see protected areas are working uh, or uh, we suppose they are working because the, uh, the index is higher inside protected areas than outside protected areas. So you set your, uh, uh, your priorities, you give weight, you exclude areas that are already protected, and you want to see where uh, with this setup uh, we need to uh, uh, draw our attention. So here you see already an hotspot uh, based on the selection we have done. Uh, so we want to compare now this, uh, this area uh, with the rest of the country or with the uh, protected areas within the country. Uh, so we select the area. As I said, you don't have a limit in terms of arcs and nodes that you draw there. And the information will be printed in the, uh, in, in the other plot and in this one that shows just the weighted values. But this one is the, the important one where you can actually uh, compare information and see why that area is important compared to the rest of the country or to the rest uh, of the areas that are protected within the country. So that's it. Thank you.